Last thing for today, I wanted to give you guys a little quick tour of heat transfer and how heat flows between systems. We've talked about, you know, about heat affecting the system, but we haven't talked about how it moves in or out of a system. So there are three different types of heat transfer, um, two of which we're going to talk about in some detail. Um, so the first is conduction which is maybe what we normally think of as heat transfer. Uh, you touch something and it feels hot. Um, so this conduction is usually through a solid. You can look at conduction between liquids or through liquids and gases also, but because they're moving, that gets more complicated as we'll see in a moment. Um, our picture of conduction looks kind of like this. So we have something that's hot. We have something at a hot temperature over here and we have something at a cold temperature over here. And between the two, we have some material, some solid material connecting them. And this is, I should draw this as three-dimensional. This is supposed to be three-dimensional. So, um, so our conduction is the heat flow through through this solid because of this temperature difference. So things that matter here are the length of this thing. I'll draw that vertically. That is an L. <laughs> the cross-sectional area A of our thing that is conducting. And we're assuming that this is, you know, the same width all the way along it. is the cross-sectional area. And that's pretty much it. We're ready to write down the equation. So the equation is this, uh, the rate of heat flow, like how much energy per time, we write as Q over delta T. And that is equal to uh, some things about the geometry. So A over L, uh, how big this temperature difference is, delta T, and finally, some property of this material, of this stuff, that tells us how easily heat can move through it. So that is this value K. This is the uh, heat, or really it's called the thermal conductivity. This is to distinguish it from the electrical conductivity, which fits in a very similar looking equation, and you'll see that if you take physics 211. So the thermal conductivity is a property of whatever material this, uh, this conduction is happening through. So some values of K, I'll write, um, I'll write a little table just with some, a range of values. So uh, aluminum, a, uh, you know, a metal that conducts heat, okay. Uh, it has a K of 240, and this has units of, um, no, I shouldn't, I will get this wrong. Uh, watts per meter Kelvin is what pops into my head. I hope that's right. We'll say all of these Ks are in watts per meter Kelvin. If I'm remembering those units right, if I'm not remembering those units right, I will correct myself somehow later. So that's how easily heat flows through aluminum. It is more difficult for heat to flow through glass. So glass has a much lower value. Glass has a thermal conductivity of 0 0.8. So the same sized piece of glass between the same two, you know, temperatures is going to flow, let's see, 0 0.8 times 300 is 240. It's going to only flow 1 300th as much heat as the same piece of aluminum. So glass is a better thermal insulator than aluminum. Uh, styrofoam is a really good thermal insulator. It is much better than glass, 0 0.035. So that's like um, less than a 20th as conductive as glass. And that's like, you know, one, two, three, four orders of magnitude less than aluminum. Styrofoam is a good thermal insulator. That's why they make coolers out of it. Uh, 
And lastly, uh, one of the worst insulators or best thermal conductors is diamond. This is because the crystal structure of diamond is very well connected. You have, you know, sp3 bonds connecting atoms together and the bonds are really strong and that ask me more about thermal conductivity later it turns out it's a very interesting thing to look at the k for diamond is like 2000 so diamond is almost 10 times as thermally conductive as as aluminum so if we know the geometry of the thing doing the conducting the a and l we know the temperature difference and we know what the stuff is made of we can figure out how many joules per second or how many watts of power are flowing, you know, watts of power in the form of heat are flowing from this hot side to this cold side. And I've drawn this geometry as if this is a long bar, but it doesn't have to be. You can do these same calculations for a like thin sheet of glass between two different temperatures or something like that, where a, you know, it's, it's much, much wider than it is thick. You can still use the same equation. It doesn't have to be, the geometry doesn't have to look like this. It can be, you know, short and really wide. Okay, the next heat transfer we're going to talk about is convection, which we are not going to spend very much time on, not because it is simple, but because it is really just too complicated to discuss in detail. So the idea of convection is that if you have a fluid that is at a different temperature than you know, something nearby it, that fluid, for example, if that fluid absorbs some heat, it might change its density slightly. This definitely happens with air. To some degree, this happens with water as well. And if that fluid expands, uh, you know, if, it, if, that, if that fluid heats up, it is going to expand a little bit, and consequently, it's going to have different, like, buoyant forces on it, and it might feel a force upward that's going to cause it to rise away from the hot thing leaving room for more cold fluid to follow behind it. So that looks something like this. Here is our um, science mug of coffee that is at tea hot, but yeah, it's probably too hot to drink, so don't, don't do that. See, it's got these hot lines on it. Okay, so imagine that we are some little parcel of air here. We're some small quantity of air, and this air is just sitting next to the mug, so this air is going to have some heat flow into it by conductivity, basically. So this fluid is next to the, the ceramic, and he is going to flow into that at some rate. That actually isn't that hard to figure out. What's hard to figure out is the next part. Because of that, we have, you know, everything out here is at T cold, this is now at T hot, so it is less dense than the air around it. Hot air is less dense than cold air, and so our little piece of air here is going to rise, right? It's going to feel an upward buoyant force, and it is going to move away, and that is going to leave room for more cold air to go in and take its place. So what you end up with is this convective current That is movement of fluid, physical movement of fluid, uh, due to this heat flow. And as a result of this, you end up with you end up losing much more heat than you would if this air was just perfectly standing still. And because this depends on lots of things about the shape of the object and what's going on with the air the equations for convection turn out to be tough and not worth going into for physics 210. Um, if you're interested, you can find a book on heat transfer. There are whole engineering courses on heat transfer where you learn about how to actually calculate convection and you can spend lots of time on it. So uh, I don't necessarily recommend that, but heat transfer is what is what you're looking for. Okay, that's all we're going to say about convection. Well, I'm erasing, I guess. Uh, so Insulating materials like styrofoam or like a insulated jacket, um, you'll notice that lots of those are basically full of air with some stuff mixed in with it, like 
you know, styrofoam, it's some like polymers holding the air in place in a jacket, it might be like down or some synthetic puffy stuff. The idea there is you're relying on the low thermal conductivity of air. So the heat doesn't flow into it very quickly. And you're putting all this stuff in the way to prevent convection from happening. So the whole reason you have a jacket filled with polymer fluff or whatever, the reason that fluff is there is to keep the air from moving around and creating these little convective currents that would cool you off more quickly. All right, lastly, we have radiation. So this is not um, like, this is not ionizing radiation the way we might use it in everyday language. This just means uh, an object radiates heat. Heat goes out from it. Uh, and this is in the form of electromagnetic waves. So yes, maybe visible light, maybe radio waves, maybe infrared. Uh, this radiation could be anywhere on the spectrum. Um, all objects um, emit, emit this uh, radiation. And the wavelength of that radiation depends on the temperature. So if we have a cold object and a hot object, uh, they emit different, different kinds of electromagnetic radiation. So an object at room temperature um, emits most of its radiation in the far infrared, so that's like wavelengths of you know, a few to 10 microns or something like that. I forget exactly where the peak is for room temperature, but you know, somewhere in that vicinity. Um, hotter objects, if you heat up objects hotter than room temperature, eventually you can get it so they start emitting in the visible light. So very hot objects emit light that we can see, right? This is what glowing, glowing red hot is. It is this radiation um, because this radiated wavelength gets shorter at high temperatures. Um, for understanding this wavelength relationship, this requires some quantum mechanics and um, it's beyond physics 210. It is interesting. Um, Ask me about it if you're curious. <laughs> what we are going to learn about, though, is the amount of power um, radiated by this process. So that is our Q over delta T. Sorry, this is delta T time. What did I call this before? Heat power. This is the rate. This is the same rate of heat flow um, that we talked about earlier. Rate of heat flow. So this for radiation is equal to E sigma T to the fourth. As you're about to see, this equation is wrong. Don't write it down. There's an additional factor of A that I'm going to add shortly. So uh, T is our temperature, and this is absolute temperature. So this has to be, of course, in Kelvin. Sigma here is a constant called the Stefan Boltzmann constant not to be confused with the Boltzmann constant. The second Boltzmann constant is equal to 5.67 times 10 to the minus 8. 5, 6, 7, 8, that's how everyone remembers it. <laughs> um, true story. Watts per square meter Kelvin to the fourth. And this is wrong. There should be a factor of area in here also. Apologies for that. So this is the surface area of the object. And E here is something called the emissivity. Emissivity. And this is this is how good an object is at radiating. So this is between zero and one. So usually, you know, you'd use 0.8 or something, I don't know. Uh, zero represents an object that is perfectly reflective, and therefore, because it's reflecting light, it turns out it does not have to emit any radiation. Um, one is something that, uh, that actually both perfectly absorbs radiation and emits this maximum amount of radiation. So a value of one here uh, implies this perfect radiator and absorber. 
that is called a black body. And this equation is sometimes known as black body radiation because this is the kind of radiation emitted by these, these ideal black body emitters. All right, that's a messy, messy box, but we got it. All right, um, so this is the amount of heat flow emitted by an object. It turns out if you have an object that is, um, that is in an environment, it also feels heat radiation from the environment. So if we have that happening, if we're in an environment at T environment, then we have something that looks like this. The net heat flow, Q net over delta T, is equal to E sigma A T to the fourth minus T of the environment to the fourth. So depending on what this temperature difference is, uh, you know, this is not just a delta T anymore. This is T to the fourth minus T to the fourth. So this looks a lot different than our conductivity. This t to the fourth thing is kind of a big deal. Um, e sigma a t to the fourth. Oops. Uh, and what I mean by that is we don't we don't see exponents this big very often. So if we double the temperature of an object, if we raise its temperature from room temperature 300k to 600k. We're increasing T by a factor of two, which means we're increasing this power that it's emitting by a factor of two to the fourth, which is 16. So doubling your temperature increases your amount of power by 16. That's a lot. It turns out that in a lot of cases, you can pretty much ignore radiation. At low temperatures, radiation is much, much less than, um, typically much, much less than convection or um, or conduction, but at high temperatures, radiation is almost always going to dominate because this T to the fourth gets, you know, so big at 1,000 Kelvin or 2,000 Kelvin. Uh, 